Hey, greetings, folks. Welcome to Adventures in Imperfect Living. I'm Greg Willits from RosaryArmy.com. And I'm Jennifer Willits, his wife. We had a, a trip this week. We actually went to Columbus, Ohio. I think we told you that we were going to be doing this. Uh, had the opportunity to go up and film the journey home for EWTN. Uh, it'll air sometime this spring. They've told us tentatively like April 15th or something like that. I don't know if it's actually going to happen, but it was a... It was it was an educational experience for us in more ways than one, uh, and so we'll get into that a little bit in this this episode, talking about sort of our. Uh, we don't want to go into too much detail on our conversion stories because we want you to actually watch the episode of the Journey Home when it airs. Uh, if you've never seen the Journey Home, it's from the Coming Home uh, International Group there uh, in Ohio. Marcus Grodi started it. John Mark Grodi is now the uh, he's the host of the show. So he John Mark, who we've met in the past, we talked about him on an episode or two ago we've met before um great guy a lot of great great people working for for uh coming home yeah it's coming home international and then the journey home is the program and yeah. i always want to intersperse the yeah. two so if i <laughs> if i accidentally do that the show is called the journey home it airs i think monday nights 8 p.m eastern on ewtn but the organization is coming home international but uh, so we've had we've had a chance to meet these guys but it, it was educational for us because it forced us to revisit our own journey uh, into the church, and I'm a cradle Catholic, you're a convert, and what that meant. So again, we'll get into that, and we'll kind of share. We, we were just surprised by how this turned out, and, and it was interesting to go visit another studio because we have been in the midst of, uh, if you've been watching the show for a while or listening, you know that uh, a little over a year ago, but almost a year and a half ago, we built the studio that we're in right now, and we have constantly been trying to improve it and figure out how do we do more things in here, School of Mary Productions, uh, we did all of the Total Consecration new content last year and and several other things. Well, we just filmed a new course at the beginning of this year. I mean, it's like as soon as the the giving campaign was over, we just kept running. Um, we had Deacon Matthew Newsom in the studio. I don't think I have his book nearby. I think it's it's out of out of reach. But Deacon Matthew Newsom, he we had him on the program last week or last year for his book, The Devout Life, and we immediately started talking to him about driving here to Atlanta and uh, having him do a course on it. And I thought it was going to be like a five part course. Maybe it would be two and a half hours of content. I think in the long run, it ended up, it's going to be like 10 to 12 parts. And I think it's going to end up being like a five hour course all said and done. And somehow Jennifer and I ended up in this more than we thought. So we did yeah, all that. That was definitely a surprise to me, but you know what, in, in this line of work in ministry, I've learned uh, to be very flexible, pivot to patiently you have endure to pivot. when you think your day is going to go one way and it doesn't, <laughs> and you need to be like, oh, okay, I'll abandon all of my plans. So if, if you if you're watching the show <laughs> right now rather than listening to it, uh, here I'll do a quick video and we'll we'll uh, include the video in this. I, I just want to show what what a complete and total mess the studio is right now, and what? I have. You think this is a mess right here? Uh, I have wires. It was a mess. This is way cleaned I, up. I, uh, the, the, Super well, maybe cleaned I won't up. Do this. The camera isn't <laughs> wanting to cooperate with me quite as much as I as I wanted. But it's like the 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 desk is a disaster area. Everything is a mess. Jennifer, you're not a mess, but thank it's, you. Anyway, so I'm I'm mm. trying to do a better job of of making it so that we can sit down and quickly record stuff. But what you'll notice that if you're watching it, some things are out of place. The table that is directly in between us and looks really awkward right now. We're trying to figure out <laughs> awkwardly placed we're, right in the middle. <laughs> well, number one, I th th we've had this table for a few years. We bought this like right after we moved in the house five years ago, and we, we've constantly been sort of like, well, where, maybe we put it here, maybe we put it there, and it kind of has served a, pl a place here. But when we filmed the Devout Life, it it made a lot of sense to have Deacon Matthew sitting at that table, and we positioned cameras at him. But what that did was it sort of created this domino effect. And it just reminded me again how difficult it is anytime we try to record something other than this show to reposition the cameras and redo all that stuff. And, and really the goal is, and if you watch any YouTubers, the goal for most YouTubers is like how quickly can you get to record? And we've gotten it pretty pretty good with, with this setup. But even now it's already a little out of, out of place because we had to move stuff and then I had to move it back to get to this. So having Deacon Matthew... In the, pro, or in, in the studio, and then for us to go to Ohio and go to the Coming Home studios, which is a whole, 
Yeah, yeah, talk. And see another studio. Yeah, see how they have it set up. So that we can be tempted by studio envy. <laughs> yeah, there's de- there was definitely studio <laughs> envy going so on like, just because oh. they have a larger space for their set, and then they have a completely different place where all of the equipment was. Whereas I'm constantly trying to figure out how to put everything in here at once and have a studio where we could do multiple types of things. So we, we've done the three-camera set up with the couch and the two chairs multiple times. Last week's show with Dr. Jerry Crete, that was with our studio with the, the sofa and the two chairs. And we, we're not 100% happy with the way it looks, partially because you keep seeing our legs more than we like, yes. more than Jennifer likes. The, 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 we don't like all the gangly leg things. And yeah. then on the couch, what we realized is, I, particularly me, I'm tall. I'm six four something, right? I I slouch. I just immediately, as the show goes on, <laughs> if you go back and watch last week's show, I was talking to Dr. Jerry. He starts at this start, level. Start, start, start very straight, you know, a good posture. And then I just slowly shorter, start to, shorter. I'm just slumping down. <laughs> and, and I, you know. We, so that, that is really funny. Because Ben does the exact same thing. Our Ben. And and our Sam and our Ben. Those are the only two. Sam slumps? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I guess he does. I guess he he does. starts out here, but then within five minutes, if he can lay down, he's going to find a way to lay down. Yeah, he's like laying on his shoulder blades. Yeah. 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 That's, and, I don't know. So, that's the thing. So anyway, yeah. having having Deacon Matt here, going to Journey Home, I already was, actually started even when we did the uh, our 500th episode when the Barons were here. Just have got to figure out a way. Now that we've been filming in here for a year, we've learned a lot of lessons of like what needs to be repositioned, what needs to stay, and what needs to go in terms of um, hosts. So I'm going. This is my last episode. No, what what goes in terms of the stuff that we have in here? Is the little furniture parts working, or what can we do? But one of the things that that we we discovered, if we want to have four people at once, because we filmed with three people with Deacon Matthew, and I kind of liked the look. When we were just at the table, and so how could do, do we get a slightly larger round top, and that might solve a, the problem for quick to video for four people because you know we've been promising you and we for a long time. I say promise. We have been talking about the possibility of reviving what we're dealing with the Barons for like two years now, and it keeps falling down to like, well, then do it, Greg. And I'm like, I can't figure out how to how to pull us all together in an easy way that doesn't disrupt everything else that that we're doing. So anyway, long story short, I'm in the process of just I'm I'm will I'm getting ready to take everything out and bring everything back in again. And so after this show is recorded, I kind of have a bank of two weeks before we really have to record again. I think maybe only a week before we really have to mm-hmm. record again. Uh, and so, because I, I, I think I'm gonna. I mean, you don't see I have I have poles all over the place in here with wires. I, I mean, it's. It, it's really hard to make it look clean all the time, and and it's my office. This is where I work, and so I can't work in a in a I can't work in a mess. It it just totally it, right. So it it is a unique like decorating challenge, and that's because we're asking a lot out of one room. Yeah, we want it to be the studio. We want it to be the writing place where you can write a book, which means it has to be open and clear it also needs to be the editing room and it needs it has to just function in so many ways and we just need lily and ben to move out and we could take over their the bedrooms. whole house yeah, yeah well, we could take over their bedrooms as additional uh, sets i don't know so that that, that that's that kind of a sad <laughs> future so, it's like i want <clears throat> people <laughs> so going going up to uh, to ohio i mean that was one thing that was on my brain it was like as soon as i walked into into their studio First thing I did was I walked over. What cameras are they using? They have like I don't know if you those know, tripods were really well, cool. Well, the, the tripods were very nice. They, they had these, wheels. These pivot ball um, cameras that, so that they do it. They can manage everything. They had remotely. like a joystick. Yeah. yeah, it was like he was flying a plane. Yeah, he would move the joystick, yeah. and the camera in the actual they didn't have studio to... room would just rotate its head around yep. accordingly. It yep. was like, what is that? Exactly. And so stuff like that, I went, oh. <laughs> Oh. Okay, now. <laughs> now, one other thing, and I wish I took a picture of it. They probably don't want me to talk about this, but I'm going to talk about this. If you ever watch The Journey Home, there's a bookshelf in the background. It's like, you know, like all good EWTN programs, there's bookshelves. Okay. Did you look at the bookshelf? I know about it. Did you go look at it? Not up close. Well, what do you mean you know about it? I know that it is there to fulfill a particular purpose. Yeah. Of aesthetic design, right. colors important, right. like size of book. It's just to give a, an appearance of like 
you know, library, Knowledge. academia, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but I already know not to really look closely at those titles. Titles. There might be Pinocchio up there. I yep. don't know. You know, like Alice you, in Wonderland. Right now, it, that's not the purpose. Is to be a, a working library. It's meant to give the appearance of one. Well, so. I I kind of said to myself, I know what some of those books are. Yeah. I, I even before walking in, I bet you anything that that's what some of those are. And when we got there, and I walked over and I just felt very proud of myself. I was like, there it is. There's a Reader's Digest condensed books right there. It's, I knew it was going to be there, like top shelf. <laughs> Reader's Digest condensed books. So, but the the I mean, it was just really cool seeing yeah. some of the behind the scenes how they did it, and it also made me stop and think. Okay, you know, not everything has to be perfect for it to still look good on the screen. So, for example, you see this the, this ugly thing behind me, this table that has this long. Well, there's things that you could do to pretty that up, mm -hmm. and and it might look ugly up close but on screen it could look better so the desk for example that they sit at well if you go behind it and you can see exposed plywood at, at the journey home it's like yeah it's a set right it is yeah, a, it is it, a set it, is it was a, a reminder set. of but, that and so that's true so going up there so we were invited to be on the program four years ago and the covid hit and um a few things behind the scenes so so matt swain is just he's a peach of a guy He's just he's the and, dude has energy. Let me got, tell he's you, he's got a lot of energy. So Matt <laughs> he Swain, does. he is the host of the Sunrise Morning Show, which airs on EWTN, and that's how we first got to know him umpteen years ago. Uh, it was it's based out of Cincinnati, and so Matt was living in Cincinnati doing the Sunrise Morning Show, which is then aired on EWTN. And he came over uh, when we were doing an audio book, and I think we shared this recently. He, uh, doing an audio book at Servant Books when we wrote The Catholics Next Door: Adventures in Imperfect Living, he came over. Say hello so we can meet in person. We had been on the Sunrise Morning Show when he was the producer of the program. We had had him on our show because he wrote a couple of books, and then he and his wife wrote a book. And I think his, I think Colleen wrote a, a book on her own as well. And so I know that we've had Swames on our program on multiple instances. So we, that, that was the only time that we met in person, though. So that was way back in 2010, 2011. Have been on the Sunrise Morning Show on multiple occasions. I would not be surprised if I end up on it again in May, he doesn't ask me every May 4th to be on the program to talk about Star Wars and and uh, uh, the Catholic Church. And quite honestly, and Matt, I mean, even though Matt was born after Star Wars came out, the first, he admitted, I love this, the first Star Wars movie he actually saw in the theater was The Phantom Menace. Which that, is, That's really... It's, crazy. it's a little sad, but little sad. honestly, what choice did he have? He didn't. He have, didn't have he didn't the have options that we were but, fortunate to have. <laughs> but he, his knowledge base of of just stuff, I, I I feel like I have a well rounded knowledge base. He has a, he's he's got he doesn't just have a well rounded knowledge base, but then he's quoting C.S. Lewis stuff on top of that. I mean, he's just all over, and and so he invited us back on uh, to be on the 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 journey home, and finally. Making it happen, going up, he's gonna. Uh, he arranged everything for us, flying into Columbus, Ohio, which was a whole other thing. Flying into Columbus has all sorts of. It's interesting. We're going up to talk about conversion. In my case, I'm a cradle Catholic, but my full acceptance of the church. How how much of my life, even though I only lived in Columbus, Ohio, as a kid, moved there in the middle of second grade, moved away right after seventh grade ended. So from like 78, 79, something like that, until um, spring of, beginning of summer of 1984, moved away. But how many core things and how many core personality formational things happened in that town? And so it was really kind of weird because we, we fly into the airport and we were staying at the hotel right next to the airport. And just knowing, looking at a map, the house I lived in and the neighborhood I lived in and all these thousands of memories I have were just 11 miles away, but we didn't have a rental car. And you know me, normally if we go somewhere where I've lived, you're going to revisit. I want to go on a tour. Yeah. All the childhood mm -hmm. locations that you can. And I, I still have childhood friends that live in Columbus. And so mm -hmm. I actually ha had been in contact with um, Susie who lived next door and then Amy who lived a few doors down. And again, I haven't seen, I haven't seen Susie since my brother Paul got married, and that was in 1990. And I haven't seen Amy since we moved away in 1984. Uh, but 
trading messages with them on Facebook. Thought maybe we could get together and have a cup of coffee. That didn't work out. Um, traded messages with my long lost foster sister Kelly. Couldn't get together and see her. Couldn't go over there. But I tell you what, the one guy who I can always count on is my buddy Aaron, who lived behind me. Met Aaron several years younger than me, so I, I don't even know how old Aaron was when we met. I was in second grade when I met Aaron. Aaron's brother was in diapers, and they're still two of the greatest friends I've ever had. And and so I wasn't quite sure where Aaron was, what he was going. And I, I texted him. I said, "Hey, don't you work near the airport?" I said, "I just flew in." He said, "Yeah, I could be there." You know, he was there in fifteen minutes. He so like between texting him and seeing this kid that I grew up with, that you know, all the memories I have with him. Aaron comes walking in, and we just had a great time visiting with him. And so, so that kind of satisfied my nostalgic itch that needed mm-hmm. to be scratched mm-hmm. when we were in Columbus. There were so many things that I wanted, I wanted to um, experience while we were there, but that, that was great. And because I was going through my own emotional reactions to the travel, the way I felt on the plane, which was not very good, um, I wasn't able to really – empathize with what was happening to you like it didn't even really occur to me how surreal that would be to you're in Ohio to talk about your journey which means you're going to look to your past to recall a story so where do we go to literally some place from your timeline as Columbus is is a marker on your personal timeline of your past and so I didn't have that Columbus didn't have that connection to me and plus, I was a little distracted by, I, I literally wrote down 10 things that were disturbing me on that day. About we, life in general. About, not, yeah, not about, about life in day. general. But it was just all hitting and coalescing at the moment we were just decompressing in the hotel room while you were reaching out to your friend to see if you could meet. So just to show you, you know, husbands and wives, we're, we're, we do everything together. We work together. We live together. We do, you know. We were on that show but together. We, yeah. But we have. Two different. We had two different headspaces. Like you were more up, upbeat. You're wanting to reconnect with an old friend, and I'm literally like a foot <laughs> next to you in the hotel. You know, we're just sitting on our bed, and I'm just like trying not to cry. I mean, like I was in a completely different place, um, but yet here we were side by side, about to embark on the same experience of recording the journey home, but we're coming at it from two very different places. Um, and I realized I, I needed to be still. I had to stop moving. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to reach out to anybody. I just needed to be still, and I just needed to talk to God. Like, that was the only dialogue I really needed at this point was just to pray through whatever I was going through in, in my mind so that I could get ready for what needed to happen. I, ne- I knew that we were going to meet with Matt for dinner, I, and I knew that that's going to require me to be on you know, be on, (laughs) be ready to just socialize and talk and be jovial and super active listener, you know, and I had to get there. That was my end point. Um, Thankfully, I got there. And I'm really glad your friend was able to join us so that I could sort of visit and be as present as I could and sort of get away from my own headspace a little bit. So I, it was a, it was and you've a met Aaron pleasant distraction. Multiple times. I mean, he's, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's always surreal to me to see someone from the past because yeah. it's like, wow, they kind of look the same, but older, but mostly the same. And, and it's like time hasn't passed. It has, we're just picking up right where we left off. And how many years had it been since you've seen him? Since I last saw Well, since yeah. 2010 was the last time I saw Aaron. Okay. So it's, 13 years, yeah. roughly. That's significant that we could just pick up. Like, yep. And he, he kind of just walked right into the hotel lobby. Like, no big deal. Yeah. Like, of course, of course I'm going to see you here. This is normal. <laughs> like, that's how it was. And then, you know, co- then Matt Swaim eventually joins us, and that's Which, even more okay. bizarre. <laughs> that was that was having Aaron come in and, and, and seeing him and talking about all the things from our childhood. That that wasn't all that weird. It, that just was nice. That was familiar. You know, that was old shoe. Just just felt good. But then when Matt came walking into the lobby after we were talking with Aaron for a while, and when I had Matt Swain from my Catholic world mixing up with Aaron, who is from my my childhood, having those two, it, it it kind of my that messed with my brain a little bit because I don't I don't know if I've had 
many of my other friends in other parts of my life ever actually meet Aaron, who was such a critical part of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And so having Matt was sort of like the first of all the people that I know to to have that moment with Aaron. It was, and that was kind of bizarre that he was the one. None of my South Carolina friends ever met Aaron. Uh, I don't think any of my Georgia friends have ever met Aaron. Maybe a couple of my Cincinnati friends met him. But for the most part, Aaron was always this island. Aaron is revealed. A a Aaron was this <laughs> island in my life. Right. You know? He was all like covered and hidden yeah. in your in your life experience. And then he, he was my <laughs> own little Aaron. I could keep him in my hand. He's my precious. <laughs> See, Aaron doesn't watch our show. Uh, so I, we're safe, right? So, well, no, no. I think I think if he watches any, if this, he's just you know, he's He'll my understand. he's my little furry precious. <laughs> furry. <laughs> he does have a lot of hair on he's his arms, very, though. He's a very hairy dude. Aaron, <laughs> yeah. Aaron, I think I think Aaron could have grown a beard when he was seven. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> he's always been a very hairy dude. Probably so. So anyway, so so all of that was you know you're right that we had differences of things going on in our brain. Mm -hmm. I was I was aware. This stuff was going on. And, and again, we talk about how nice it is as a married couple, how often God gives us the grace to one of us to be more up when the other is down and that kind of thing. So I was aware. I just wasn't sure how much um, to ruminate with you on certain things that were troubling you because mm -hmm. you did start writing down, knowing that we're going in to talk about our journeys. It's like, well, what what was our journey? And I've I've shared mine to a higher extent, much more often than you have in that I, I say, you know, I grew up in all these different churches and I had all these different experiences at different parishes in different states. And there was this common factor of most of them were loosey goosey and weren't very in depth in terms of our Catholicity. And it wasn't until my late twenties where the Eucharist was truly introduced to me, even mm -hmm. though I'm a cradle Catholic, that's, that's the summary for me. Mm -hmm. and, and once that happened, my desire to know Jesus grew by leaps and bounds because of that encounter with Jesus in the Eucharist. Whereas your story is something that we've touched on, but and we don't want to get into the full conversion story for you because we want people to watch when when the journey home comes out. But it it forced you to go deeper, I think, than you've ever had to. Like even identifying the non-denominational church that you were a part of mm -hmm. from second grade until your high school years when you mm -hmm. when you left that church altogether. And then the time, the years that you left, you know, you weren't doing anything. So talk talk a little bit about that because you were kind of, I, I think you were surprised, and this might have attributed to your your mindset and your maybe your gloom a little bit of you were facing head on something that you know, among us, you had named, but you had never really gone public with. Yeah, um, it, it all started with a, a, a little bit of a concern slash fear slash worry that I just simply was not going to remember my past. And I was worried that the whole show, I, what if I froze up on the air? It's like he's going to ask me details about my past. And, I, you know, I can't remember what I had for dinner yesterday. I mean, I live so rooted in today. I just dump the past. I, I, I just run away from it. I don't want to, I just don't ever go back there. And so Drum, I was really dr concerned. Drumsticks and green beans. Yes, that was a good dinner. Thank you for making that the other day. It was super good. Oh. Um, I knew that I had to get the basics, like a high level touch point. This part of my life was here, this kind of experience. Next part of my life was here in this location, having this kind of experience. I mean, just super high level up to present day. And then but I knew there were some gray areas, and so that's what got me looking more deeply at the church I was once a member of. And mostly your conversion, you were only living in one of two places. Versus with me, I'm all over the place. True. You were either New York until you were 10 or Georgia after right. that. Exactly. Yeah. And as I was reexamining the, <laughs> the church that I was a part of, I was bombarded with a great many memories, and it does force me to revisit things that that could cause grief and sorrow and loss. I mean, now I have to look at my parents again and my brother, and then that forces me to say, all right, my parents are no longer with us. They've already uh, lived their life, and Lord willing, yeah, I'm praying for their souls every day that they are um, with the eternal happiness with God. 
I think about my my brother's relationship and you know where we are in our faith, you know, on our journey towards God, and the difference that that exists there. Look at my extended family. I mean, I'm just looking at all of it, you know. And then that's reminding me of other people that I used to talk to. It's like, oh, let me reach out to them. And then there was just it was a reminder of how we're not all like in unison with each other. And that led me to a type of a sadness because it's a longing for togetherness that I, I, I can't bring about that change. I just have to accept the fact that we are all in different parts of the journey right now. And so your, your parents became Protestants. Your brother's a Protestant. Yeah. So, so they, your parents and then your brother still has a great love for Jesus Christ. Yeah. A great desire to know Jesus through the word, to dive more deeply into that relationship. But the fracture that still exists between Catholics and Protestants, since the Protestant, I won't even say it's a Reformation because nothing was reformed. It was a revolt. It was a separation. It was a schism away from Catholicism. That there's been so much discord that has been introduced into Christianity that we want we we don't want that Jesus prayed that they might all be that they would all be one fathers you and I are one and so Jesus has that desire for us to be one body of Christ and it's not just this nebulous body of Christ but the body of Christ that he he established in his catholic church and we believe that but your brother and others that we know and love don't believe that truth they they have a different idea of what the body of Christ is and so when we try to reconcile that in our brains, it brings sadness mm -hmm. because we desire for it to be beyond this nebulous mental thought of what the body of Christ is, and and, and it's it's just not that way. And so I think that that I mean I I definitely feel it in regards to relationships I have with other people or people that aren't that have no faith at all. I I, I feel that sadness because separation brings about sadness. Yeah, and. I was very sensitive to that as I was uh, sort of researching my own past again and getting reacquainted with those uh, events so that I could be prepared to talk about it. Not that I would definitely offer those glimpses into my past, but I knew um, from the experience of just doing this show how important it was to just to be open, be open to the Holy Spirit giving me the words to say and nudging me in a particular direction. So I, once I saw enough, I saw, I stopped. I just pulled away from all of it. I'm like, I don't, I need to be a little bit blank headed. I don't want to go in with an agenda. I don't want to go into this recording with, you know, locked and loaded. I'm going to bring up these points and I'm going to <laughs> say this particular thing because I believe it's a powerful thing to hear. And I'm like, no. Did you feel no, relief not when, doing that. when Matt actually said that's a good thing not to go in with your testimony uh, all ready to go. You're not going yeah. to give a talk. It's a conversation. And and did you feel better when he said that? Oh yeah, I was I was relieved that I was handling it the right way. Yeah. Um, and it makes a lot of sense because what comes out of your mouth needs to be authentic. It can't be this pre-scripted, you know, expose of your life. I, I'm just gonna speak from the heart, and people can tell that, especially if they're watching it on video. It's very obvious. Um, when someone is speaking that way and mm -hmm. it's more impactful. And that's, that's the point. And here was the other comfort was I couldn't get it wrong. It's my life. It's just how I lived it. It's how I experienced it. It's what I remember from particular years. So it's not right or wrong. It's just, this is what it was. And you can take from it what you will, <laughs> but this is what it was. And so I was uh, very surprised by how God loved me through all of that. You know, that's the beauty of looking back at a journey. Um, when you look at where you were and where you are today, uh, and that was a beautiful takeaway. I mean, that I, I got out of this whole process of being uh, on the journey home and having to go through my own little research on myself. It's like, wow, God really loved me and I was believing lots of uh lots of falsities lots mean, of lies it, what, what do you and again mean? I it, don't want to go too deeply I know, because but I, he he loved you when you were away from it from the from him uh, or, or when when you say that you had that realization uh, oh yeah of what point 
were you realizing that? Because you know that now. Yes. And you can't always have these realizations until time has passed and you've arrived at another point in your on your timeline, on your journey, on your path to God. Then you realize, okay, I'm only here because of the love from the past. That's why I'm here. Oh, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. That's that's interesting. So wait a minute, say that again. You you I know I'm here because of the way God loved me in the past. It helped to ensure that I am okay. where I am today, receiving the love of today, which is a whole other meditation I was able to sort of think about was just the notion of time and how God is outside of it and how we're just sort of rooted in it. We can't really escape it. We're, we are human living on a timeline from point A to point B. We're linear. We're, that is the way we are made to move through this existence, and we can't change that until we have died and are hopefully joining God uh, uh, in heaven, and we can be outside of time with him. But that's not where we are right now. And and sometimes it's fun to sort of step out of yourself for a little bit and just look at that, just contemplate it. It's like, man, God God knew I was going to be praying for a certain person today, and I didn't know I was, but he knew it because he's outside of time. You know, it's just things like that that just make me go like, that's really cool, God. You are so smart. <laughs> But I'm thinking of all these things. What, what, what I found interesting was I was hearing, it was sort of like I, I always like to think about Back to the Future 1 and 2. And I, and I remember when I saw Back to the Future 2, I loved how this movie that I had already really gotten to know in Back to the Future, how they then did scenes in Back to the Future 2 where you saw the same scene that you're familiar with from Back to the Future 1, but from a different perspective. So instead of looking at it from, you know, the 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 final dance where the kids that are dancing looking up at Marty McFly playing guitar, you know, from the floor up, in Back to the Future 2, you saw that second Marty, the time-traveling Marty, up in the rafters looking down at himself. And, and, and I felt like that happened a little bit in listening to your story. I know so many parts of your story mm-hmm. But I was seeing it from a slightly different angle when we went to uh, Ohio for the journey home, and hearing you, I could I could tell that you were sort of having a realization of seeing it from a different perspective. And to, when you talk about God loving you, I think maybe what you were seeing for the first time was how much God was loving you, even as even as all the things that were being done to you, because part of you leaving your non-denominational church, while you weren't super happy there, you were kind of pushed out. It was almost like that choice, the choice to leave God then was almost taken away from you. Someone else did it for you. Someone pushed you away from God because you didn't know any better. You were 16 or whatever. And, and hearing you tell that story really was a different perspective for me to look at it. And also another thing that was really different for me was the realization of if that happened around 16, and I don't know why I it thought— It could be maybe older, Well, yeah, maybe but, 18. But, but even still, if it was 18, and the fact that you and I didn't meet until we were 24, there was more time of you wandering than I realized, which makes even more sense of some of the earlier conversations that you and I had, mm-hmm. even before we started dating, of like just faith in general and and your surprise over th- over you know my own weak Catholicity I had when I was twenty four years old. The fact that I was Catholic, the fact that I went to church, you were surprised by those things, even though we were the same age. Well, you were older, but you know, still. Um, but those were things that kind of became more evident to me. In listening to your story again, mm-hmm. and, and and realizing even more how much more of a conversion you had than me, I mean, I, I feel like mm-hmm. I had a full embrace of the church. I never quite fell away from it. I, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I, I I definitely got weak at one point where I wasn't going to mass very often, that kind of thing. But I, I wouldn't say I ever truly fell away. Therefore, to revert. If anything, I was just like, oh, I'm, here's how I would describe your situation. My situation. Yes, you had. A journey within the home. <laughs> you were already home, but you had to go on a journey inside the home to get to yeah. the best part of the home. <laughs> I don't know. If, I don't know if anyone's come up with a, a word yet to describe my type of journey. And I know I'm not alone. I know there's. No, a, you I know there's not. a lot of people my age that we we were were to call me a cradle Catholic. Okay, fine. That just means I was baptized Catholic. Mm-hmm. I grew up in the church. It was a wishy-washy Catholicism, but I wouldn't even call it that. It was something. It was 
I was. Um, but you didn't know it was that. I, did, I didn't that, know. So you can't say those terms back then. I, you can only say it now I, because this is where you are. So there's got to be a better <laughs> phrase for it. And, and, yeah. and if I ever come up with that, I think I'm going to make make a, a million dollars off that book because I think people are trying to figure out because it's a, it's a sense of there is a sense of loss and there's a sense of wandering. There's a sense. But you're, you're right. I was wandering within my own house. I was yeah. I was I was already. That's I mean, that's right. I was home. But still lost. You were looking for the church inside of the church. I was looking. No, I don't know. That's really. It's a. That's an interesting. I see. You. You kind of just. You just gave me a challenge that I don't really like. Na- naming that. Yeah. Be- naming that state because I yeah. feel like it would be really important because that's one thing on their show, right? That they want to have a lower third, something to put on the bottom of the third screen part of the screen. Yeah. That labels you. Right, so at first it was going to be you in know, three words or less. That, that it's like Greg and Jennifer Willits, you know, they are uh, this and that, cradle Catholic <laughs> and former non-denominational uh, Protestant. Oh, or whatever. that's how they, that's what they wanted yeah, to have. Yeah, but don't say where, where it but is. Then, but then they changed it once it. Yeah, but don't say know, what it what it in was the middle of the, to. in the middle of the filming. They were like, we're going to change at it to this. At the break, this. they came out yeah. and said, "All right, now that we know." Your story, we're going to change your lower third to better reflect who but you to, are. But to call, I mean, what do you call the generation of Catholics? It's not cafeteria Catholics. I wasn't just p- picking and choosing deliberately, right? Okay, we're part of Gen X. Gen X, yeah. That's the Gen X Catholic. Yeah, but, maybe. I th- but I, what about the people who grew up in the 60s or the 80s that maybe didn't or were born yeah, in that time. I don't know. That's different. I think this is this is really an interesting exercise because Well, it's, if you dear listener know how to identify well, this Catholic, you hear about cultural feedback. cultural Catholics, right? You're culturally What does that mean? You go to really? church. You you're going to church. I you, thought that was nominal. Well, then there's nominal Catholics. That's another category of Catholics in name only. Yeah, but 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 it was important to me at the same time. Like I was a lector at church when I was in high school and even college. Right. And that was really important to me to do. Yeah. I think you recognize there is goodness here. There is something greater here. And it is ultimately good to keep coming here, even though you may not have understood it all. You still were pulled. I got it. I got it. Oh, okay. Stupid Catholic. But no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I'm not even going to write that down. <laughs> I was a stupid Catholic, and now I'm a no, smart Catholic. No, 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 no. No, because it's like you, it, I, I was dumb. I didn't know what I had. Okay, but there's got to be a more charitable way of how Idiot. how would God lovingly refer to? It was like, you know, look at the sheep. Yeah. There, some of the sheep are wandering a little too far. They're still on the pasture, but they're not quite in the corral yet. They're just still kind of eating the grass by themselves. You know, mm. there's just not a lot of them out there. <laughs> but eventually. He just sort of responds to like, oh, wait, there's a better way or wow, there's better grass over there. I need to go in that direction. Then you went, you responded. The point is God was nudging you the way that you needed to be nudged. You had the life you were supposed to have. I think God loves you so much. He wants you in heaven at the end of the day. Yeah. And he has to make sure that you get there so that you avoid hell. So he's going to give you all the right combination of stressors and sufferings to give you the shot at responding to them so that you end up in heaven with him. And that was a takeaway that's very similar to what you were saying. It's like, you know, I can kind of look back and after telling my story again, all the mistakes I made again, God loving me in the middle of that, God nudging us to this point, right? Right. He needed both you and I to no, 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 that's not true. He didn't need us to go through those things. He took you and I going through all of all of the bad mistakes of our youth, and he said, I'm able to take all of Jennifer's bad mistakes and all of Greg's bad mistakes, and I'm able to take all of the bad things that other people did to Jennifer and all of the bad things that people did to Greg, and I'm going to move the chess pieces of those two lives and merge them into one. Sort of like I didn't know this until I was watching you and Ben play chess, that if you move your pawn all the way to the other side, that it gets turned into a queen, and then now the queen can go anywhere. You get two queens. And so, <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah. now you have – and so I felt like God moved all the pieces and said, and now look at what I have. Now I have this married Catholic couple that's all absolutely on fire for their faith, and they're able to transform uh, right. you know, so many other things because of that. Okay. That, that, 
that I, I, I saw more purpose, I guess, for the years that I was lost, even when I was inside the church. That I, I can see that even though I was lost and I did things so poorly, that he was still, he was still, he's every mistake I made, he was, he was preparing for the fix for it. Right now, let's talk about free will. Because <clears throat> some people listening to this might be like, oh, well, so then God has everything already preordained. No, you no, don't no, really no. That's have not what I said. Choices. That's not what I said. He God's saw gonna... he saw me using my free will mm -hmm. and making bad choices and making bad mistakes with my will, mm -hmm. and saying, as he is open to me, I'm I already know where this is going to go, and I'm able. To, and he had the best solutions that I I could never have come up with right. on my own. And that's the other side. We can't really ever fathom how. <laughs> Like, what is the best thing? Like, God just knows what is the best thing. And it's usually not what we think it's going to be because yeah. it's it could involve an awful lot of suffering. And, like, we don't, we're not drawn to well, that's a good point, difficult situations. Let's, let's take the hardest road because it's, because it's hard. You know, we try to avoid that. And then God's like, yeah, but, you know. How he uses suffering. Mm -hmm. It's not just a matter of suffering can be redemptive and good for the souls of other people and that kind of thing. But really, he he does use suffering to make us stronger and better people if we allow him to use the suffering. We can we can suffer and then just turn it into a source of constant complaining, of constant focusing on oh that thing shouldn't have happened to me that wasn't fair that wasn't right I you know I was a victim in that case. Or you could start to look at the suffering and try to see how God can use that suffering to make you an even better Christian, to make you an even more loved child of God. And that's definitely something that I, I you know, was, came up in, in a lot of the things that we were talking about was it actually, you know, we were having conversations from Columbus over to the studio. <clears throat> it was just you and me and Matt in the car. And, and he wasn't necessarily prepping us or coaching us, but certain questions were coming up. And at one point, I'm saying a lot of things that were negative things. And I knew that they were negative, but they were true things that happened in my life. And, you know, I think all three of us were like, but we don't necessarily want to go there. I said, oh, I know I don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. But I said, if anything, I want to say them now so that they're so that when I when these subjects come up, I'm able to say a response with greater kindness. Mm -hmm. Right than than where I than at that given moment and even when I was saying it in the car I wasn't I wasn't feeling negative even when mm -hmm. I was saying it it was like these are the truths that happened it's hard to describe them without making it sound like I'm throwing people under the bus the truth is these people did certain things and, and so on and so forth and even in the middle of those people doing those things God was saying I'm still going to be able to love that person who did that bad thing to you mm -hmm. and I'm going to be able to love you Greg at the same time. And I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe that the people who did bad things to me, even people within mm -hmm. the church, that God still loves them and God wants good for them. And I imagine I'm going to see them in heaven. And I sure hope that God helps well, me. That's the hope. God, God, God helps me between now and then to you know grow in love for them. Because I, when I imagine myself in heaven with certain people, I still get angry. I'm like, well, then obviously I have more work to do. Yeah. Right? Yes. If I think about someone who's wronged me, and then if I imagine me in heaven with that person, and if my feeling is anger... I haven't fully yes. forgiven. Yeah, that's good. You know, and, that's and, really good. And, and, well, it's. <laughs> I mean, it's good that you can see that. Well, I it's can like, see I it. see. I need to I work on it, this with can... the, and the Lord will help you. Yeah, and and but but God did that for me, right? God can see me in heaven, and God's not going. You see, but you're terrible. But yeah, I guess I could see you in heaven, but you're still terrible. And I'm going to hold it hold it against you what you did all those years ago. <laughs> God's not doing that, right? Right. And that that's what came up a little bit. That's sort of like the Marty McFly second view that I was able mm -hmm. to see, both of your life as you mm -hmm. described it, as well as my own. And and you know, because what's funny is again, we were filming this. It wasn't in Columbus, it's about an hour away from Columbus where we actually filmed. But I told a couple of stories about a couple of parishes that I attended as a kid. Well, those were parishes in Columbus, Ohio, where a couple of those things happened. Mm -hmm. You know, a beach ball being tossed around, and I said it was that was at a campus church. I'm like, well, no, <laughs> I'll just say I was living in Columbus when that happened. You know, and 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 I told a story about a priest. You know, timing or we would time the mass because the priest was just like whipping through it so quick as if it was nothing. That was in Columbus. You know, so those were my experiences there. So, 
In the 70s or 80s? Yeah, both. Uh, okay. the, the, uh, yeah. 1979, I think, is when we moved there. I always get confused. It was either 78 or 79. I'm pretty sure it was 79. Like, we moved there in, at the tail end of January, beginning of February of 79. And and so it was 79 and then early 80s. So a lot, just a, Okay. So because <clears throat> those things happen in your past, yeah. as as things that I wonder, why did that have to, why did I have to go through that chapter of my life in that particular church? But look at what, how much greater we can appreciate what oh, we yeah. have today oh, yeah. precisely because of what we had in the past. I, I think that a lot of those things from the past are why... We appreciate the why things I'm of so, today. Why I'm so happy to attend the, the mass that we do now. I mean, do right? we not see the same thing in our children? They are not born with the ability to have this wise appreciation for all things. They just don't know. They only know yeah. whatever experience you're going to throw at them on that particular day. And they need the passage of time. And they need to be knocked down a few pegs, if you will, before they go, oh. No. Oh, that was good. Okay. Like our, our son, Tommy, now has an appreciation for some things that he never had appreciation before because he's living in a house with a couple of roommates. So he's getting a taste of head of household responsibilities, although it's a little bit lighter. But he's starting to make these connections of, oh, I didn't realize how you, mom and dad, had to do these things that I've never had to do before because you did it for me. I got to do it for myself now because if I don't do it, it isn't going to get done at all. You know, it's those lessons. And I think, well, I mean, how often is God the Father looking down at us going, you're figuring it out. Yeah. You're getting it, but you need time. We need time to pass. We need experiences under our belt to learn the lessons. We can't rush this. No. And only God knows what needs to happen in our timeline to get us to learn the lesson that we need to learn. So maybe the mistakes that you made in the yeah. past and the things that happened to you in the past, maybe they did happen more for a reason than than you realize. So we had a great trip. It, uh, it was. We'll let you it, know. It was very uh, – it pulled on the resources. It did. We were exhausted. <laughs> we were uh, totally exhausted. Get, getting back was, was <laughs> Super fun. a lot longer. We were, we were supposed to – Land in Atlanta. Talk about landing the plane. Yeah, <laughs> land in Atlanta, seven thirty on Tuesday. We filmed all day on Tuesday, um, and so Matt dropped us off at the airport. I don't even know at what time. Three, it was. three, three thirty, something like that. Three p.m. And uh, we were supposed to board a plane, five thirty plane, something like that. Yep. The plane finally left Columbus, Ohio, at nine thirty that night. We landed in Atlanta uh, around eleven thirty. We got home. We got home at one thirty. Climbed into bed. Yeah, we're climbing into bed around one thirty in the morning. And it was it was rough. We were exhausted, but I I got to. Wait. I don't even know how you drove home. That was a mystery to me. Well, let me tell I you, I was in and out of consciousness let, the entire way. <laughs> let, let, let me just admit, me too. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how we got home either. I was and like, coming, I was coming in and out. It of felt consciousness. like coming in and out of anesthesia. Like you're trying to like, hey, what's that? Are you driving? Ugh, and then you're sleeping. And it, that just made your fever dream even worse too, because I, I I decided I needed to listen to something on the way home, so I put on the latest Catholic in a small town. And so I was listening to Mac and Catherine as yeah, we're driving. Yeah, I it, remember that. We they live, were there. We live more than an hour away from the airport, so it takes a long time. And so it's like, and, and even still, that tells you how long their last show was because it's like I couldn't even get through the whole show when we, we got home. All I remember is that in my dreamlike state, they were just talking about movies. Yeah, you just kept hearing Catherine go, Barbie, Barbie. <laughs> no. Barbie. I didn't. I don't even remember. I remember her saying something about anti-Barbie. I was like, what? Anti-Barbie? I don't even know what's happening right now. And then they're talking about other movies. It's like, that's not Barbie. And then I go back to sleep again. And it's like, they're talking about The Rock. I don't know. It was confusing. Well, <laughs> it was I, funny, though. I got I to gotta tell one, one quick fun story that just meant something to me. So okay. I, I talked about my friend Aaron. And when I lived in Columbus, Ohio, we lived on, on this single street that was it, was, it was a weird street because it was considered a private drive for some reason. But it was like, it was right next to a main street. It's hard to explain this, this street that we lived on. It was weird. Seven houses were on the street. We had a creek that we all played in, and I would say everyone who lived in the, on that street, it was almost like a, a focus group got together and said, okay, what, what do we need to have here? It's like, okay, well, uh, you're going to have uh, an entrepreneur in one house. You're going to have someone who owns a trucking company in another. You're going to have a family that is from England. You're going to have you're going to have uh, a, another family that owns you know a, some major uh, you know company, and then you're going to have the Willitses. <laughs> you know, it's like we, it was just it was hard to write the street that we lived on. And I think part of that, that uniqueness of it and the time that we lived there 
it's why I have so many strong memories from that and, and from my childhood. But one thing that I really remember was how cool it was that we lived right next door to this family that owned a candy company. And this does, I mean, it sounds like I'm making something up and I'm totally not. This is like a dream come true we for a child. We live next door <laughs> to a family. To Willy Wonka. Basically, we live next door to Willy Wonka. And, and at first I didn't fully understand this. But like the first year that I lived there, everyone was like, you go to, and I'll just say the Z's house. Mm -hmm. You go to the Z's house because the last name started with yeah. Z. Go to the Z's house because they give out full-size candy bars. I'm like, okay, well, aren't all candy bars full-size in the size that they're at? You know, I didn't understand this. I'm Teeny tiny size? Isn't that a full-size yeah, candy? <laughs> so, so, again, this would have been 79, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So we go to the Z's house, first, first house on the street. Ring the doorbell. Mrs. Z opens up the door. We've gotten to know her. And sure enough, you know the, the the candy bars that they do for like fundraisers, those those big ones that you know you used to buy for a dollar or whatever. Yeah. I don't know how they sell yeah. now. Yeah. Big, big, and big thick. big thick chocolate bars, right? <gasps> they're you know, they're putting these things in our in our candy bag. And then right after Halloween, our first Christmas, the Z's come over next door, ring the doorbell. And since we're their next door neighbors, they didn't do this for all the neighbors. They just did it for us because we live next door to them. And they brought us like five five huge boxes of assorted chocolates. One box, I'll, I'll never forget this. It was the coolest thing I'd ever seen as a kid. One box, you open up the lid, and there were three large pieces of chocolate inside, spelling joy. They were each letters, J-O-Y, oh, okay. all made in chocolate. I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? I do have joy. That J, Look at this. Yeah, exactly. That J is as big as my right arm. It's like, I mean, it was just like, it was, it was amazing, and so it was just really cool. And then, like, I, the first year or two, we got to go uh, on a tour of their chocolate factory. They did this around Easter. They opened it up in like a couple days out of the out of the month. They, so anyway, that and so they had several candy stores in the Columbus, Ohio area called Anthony Thomas Candies. Anthony was the, the, the father, the grandfather, I should say, by this point. And Thomas, well, Thomas, Thomas Z is the guy who lived next door to us. He was the son. So it was a father-son candy company. I thought it was two brothers, but I looked mm -hmm. it up afterwards. And so Thomas was the one who lived mm -hmm. next door. That was Mr. Z, mm -hmm. right? And, I mean, the ridiculous stories that I could tell you about, like, like another Tom neighbor. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> we, I mean, all the kids yeah. in the neighborhood. One time, we came across some inner tubes from inside. You know, the kind that you go down a river on. Okay. That, but they were truck tire inner inner tubes, right? Mm -hmm. They were huge inner tubes, and we took two of those things and tied them together. And the Zanettas had an awesome sledding hill, and so it was. I just said their last name. Oh well, the Z's was sledding hill, <laughs> and and so so we climbed inside these two inner tubes tied together and rolled it down. And I'm inside of the tire. And I remember just kind of looking out as I'm rolling down the hill, Oof. going over and over and over again, seeing all the other kids' legs running and them screaming because I was aiming straight for the Z's house. It's like, and, and, and I hit the house and like popped out. I popped out of those tires like a, like a zit. So Anthony Thomas was the name of the company. So we're at the airport and you know, we got time to waste because our flight kept getting delayed. And I saw a souvenir sh sh uh, shop, and I wasn't going to buy anything. You know, it was like all all Ohio State stuff. And I'm like, I, you know, I'm not. My sister went to Ohio State. I wasn't a Buckeye fan. I don't care. But I walked in. And I'm looking around, and I turned around, and I, I, I literally, I think I might have audibly gasped. I gasped, <laughs> and I might have cleared some air. I think I might have jumped <laughs> because I saw a whole display. Of Anthony Thomas candies right there at the airport, and I was like, I, well, "What? Again, what? Another brush with your what? childhood past? What?" And then I, "This <clears throat> is your life, so, Greg Willis." <laughs> at the Ohio State Buckeyes. If you if you you've heard of Buckeyes, right? The, the the team. A lot of people, like our kids, had no idea. They we've made candies that are that are Buckeyes. This was something that every Friday at Catholic school in Columbus, Ohio, during the football season. That was your dessert on your lunch tray. Oh, nice! If you, if you went through the cafeteria, nice. And they so it's like they would roll up these little balls of peanut butter and they would dip them in chocolate. So only the top little bit of peanut butter is showing, and that looks like a buckeye is an actual nut. We had a buckeye tree in our yard, mm -hmm. and you, it's like this poisonous nut 
th- that we'd collect these things and we'd get in Buckeye fights. What so a really go- good idea for marketing. You, like, yeah. really confuse the children of the society. <laughs> what, what should we name this college football team after? How about Poisonous Nuts? Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and then we'll take the Poisonous Nut, we'll put it as turn a costume, and we'll be yeah. So yeah, it was turned into candy. Yeah. So anyway, so that's what it was at the at the uh, at the airport where these Buckeyes from from Anthony Thomas. I just that, so. and so of course you bought some. I, I bought a box. I didn't eat any of them. I still haven't. I brought no. them home, uh, and Lily has been enjoying them. And, to and, Lily's and, delight. And Tommy's coming over uh, tomorrow, and he asked us to save him uh, a the Buckeye last or two, one so. or two. So yeah, it's so funny. The things Good that trip. kids remember. Thanks to everyone over at, over at Coming Home International, uh, Matt and and John, Mark and Seth and Jim and and all the people that were just so kind to us and um, really made us feel at home. We had a great time. Can't wait to share the episode. It's supposed to be like uh, April fifteenth is yeah. what they said, but you know schedules change. We will let you know as we know it. So pencil it in on your calendar, right? Greg and Jennifer on Journey Home on EWTN on. Uh, 4.15 at 8 at Eastern. is, <laughs> And if you don't have EWTN, you can watch it online probably a yeah. day or two after. So that's it. Great trip. It hope was great. Hope you got something out of the stories that we talked about, of like looking back at your own life, right? And and the times that maybe yeah. you didn't realize God was there and he's ushering you to where you, he wants you to be. Maybe you're not there yet, but he wants you to keep moving along that journey, your own imperfect living journey. Your past is was needed exactly for you to be where you are today it's all part of who you are and that is one of the big things i learned from this trip like my past was actually important your past very important your past is in the past just let it go let it go but i needed it for my present you see so i so you don't know what i just did no i just had i just had images of lily as a little girl singing from the uh the uh, frozen soundtrack and and the past is in the past uh, <laughs> i have video i like how your voice got a little shaky <laughs> that, was the, that was lily, that was lily <laughs> i have a video of her trying to sing that song uh, so, you know, that, oh, as soon sweet. as you said that it was in all right all right thanks for being here pray your rosary every single day and do whatever it takes to be holy if you need a rosary go over to rosaryarmy.com we'll send you one go check out school of mary we have new courses on the way and a lot of great stuff available to you right now and if you haven't gotten consecrated get consecrated to jesus through man talk to you soon folks bye